Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Tourism Teacher Talk. This week we have Philippe. Hi Philip. Uh, Philippe. Hello, Hayley. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour. Um, he's coming to us from Paris um, and I'm in China, so uh, the other side of the world. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about experiential travel, um, which is something that that's, uh, not too many people know about and I think it's a fascinating topic. Um, so, should we start off and you can introduce yourself, tell us a bit about your story? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me to uh, to you to this discussion, this conversation, Haley. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be discussing a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, about myself, well, you have up here just a little bit of a description, but I think the the running theme, if you want to, if I want to describe my background, is actually experiential. Uh, I've got an experiential background. Uh, I was actually born in New York City, uh, eating bagels. And then, uh, and then I, I moved to France. My, my dad is American, my mom was French. We moved to France, I was at a very early age. And then I was in France savoring baguettes for breakfast and no longer bagels. Uh, mm -hmm. I did all my, um, my studies in France. I actually have an international business and marketing degree from a French business school. And after my degree, I started really a 20 year career in media and publishing. And the first stop of my career was in New York City. I missed my bagels. Um, more seriously, I really needed to reconnect with my roots. You know, it's about experiential. I, I needed to be there with the family that I hardly knew in New York City. So I was there for three years and I started working with the Wall Street Journal. Came back to France uh, with the same, same company. And then I had a, an amazing experience with Lonely Planet guidebooks. And there I touched the wonderful, marvelous world of travel from the inside, uh, working with a, an amazing publishing company that I admired for years. Uh, so that was a, a very, very, and I'll tell you more about that experience. Then the New York Times came my way um, for a position in France. And I actually worked nearly 15 years with the New York Times uh, doing uh, work on uh, uh, syndication, licensing work, uh, but really the running thread in my 20 year career in media and publishing has been storytelling, what I describe as you know, narrative journalism, uh, telling you know, quality storytelling, quality stories. Uh, so experiential is con clearly connected there. And, um, and although my, my years at Lonely Planet were brief, they had a very strong impact on me. And Haley, I know you're going to completely relate to this. You're working, when you work in the travel industry and my years at Lonely Planet, every single meeting I had, people were smiling and they're just opening up. And before you actually start discussing you know, a work project, you're talking about your holidays, you know, before or after, you're talking about your, your trips, your forecoming trips, your past trips, your memories. Uh, so, so I really, really, at one point, I wanted to come back and reconnect with my passion, which is travel and also storytelling, uh, which I'll tell, you, I'll tell you more about. It, before I, I actually was able to go back to, to the world of travel, and, and working for the industry, uh, the travel industry, I, I was lucky enough to, to extensively travel on my own for business for, for nearly 20 years. Uh, so that's in a bit of a nutshell, my, uh, my experiential background uh, to share with you. It sounds like you've uh, definitely had a lot of um, things to keep you busy. And I'm a big fan of Lonely Planet. I don't know if you can see, I've got many on the shelf behind you. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's become more of a collection than anything now. And, so and I can't just, go to maybe, a new destination without it now. <laughs> and, and maybe just also for um, for, for everyone, the, the interesting uh, uh, experiences I had with Lonely Planet and the New York Times has also been around how storytelling has evolved, right? I sort of, I witnessed firsthand how you went from telling a story uh, just in a print format to, to needing to connect with new audiences in many, with many different platforms, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet. And now you're actually seeing Lonely Planet uh, releasing guides with um, drone footage, with sort of augmented reality type uh, technology where you have the guidebook, but you, it's actually a former colleague of mine at Lonely Planet who developed this for Lonely Planet France, where you actually can go in the, the guidebook and click uh, with your phone uh, and with a QR code and see a footage uh, of a drone of the destination you're going to travel to. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was quite fascinating for me, both at the Lonely Planet, New York Times, 
to witness the change, the evolving, uh, the evolution yeah. of storytelling on different formats, and also the the skill set that you need to uh, to 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 uh, to accompany that evolution. Mm. Yeah, interesting. It's it's definitely interesting how things have evolved and changed over the years, um, and that's a really good example. Um, so, tell us then, what exactly is experiential travel? So, it's it's this is a very important uh, important question, obviously, and I didn't expect to have this picture, but it's a perfect picture to illustrate what I'm going <laughs> to share with you. <laughs> so, experiential travel is many different things to many different people. I feel, this is my personal opinion, and you might share it or not, I feel that it's sometimes overused. And you know, it, you're, you're putting the word experiential in many different, different ways, in many different contexts, uh, experiences, experiences. Some people are fed up with that word. However, a very simple way to define uh, what it is not, and I'll start with that, Experiential travel is not conventional sightseeing tourism. One could add, you know, passive tourism. I'll, I'm being bold intentionally here. Um, the image you're using is, you know, picture yourself on a boat. So if you're on a boat and you're just on the surface and it, you're just enjoying the ride just for the, the beauty, that is fine. But you're on the surface. Mm -hmm. Let me dive into, and again, the, the nice an analogy, Let's let's dive into the water. Let's go below the surface. Experiential travel is, and I'm going to throw out a few and share a few words. And again, it's for everyone to define and go as deep as they want, as they can. If you're a good swimmer and you want to swim more and stay longer in the water, you'll, you'll see I, I love metaphors. So I'm going to use quite a few. Great. Great way to explain it. <laughs> But really key words for, for me that resonate to me about experiential travel are immer immersion. It's engagement. It's connection, interaction, collaboration with locals. It's this adventurous spirit. It's inspirational, being inspired, insightful. Um, then you reach keywords, key notions or values such as authenticity. You mm -hmm. reach creativity discovery, curiosity. And if there's one maybe key, if you want to have the headline, experiential equals what? Experiential travel to me equals emotion, emotional, uh, and going really deep into that emotional connection that it, it will, that experience you lived will stay with you forever and ever. And not only it will stay, stay with you forever, but you will cherish that moment in time, I call it a capsule in time, forever. Uh, now, just to finish on experiential travel, again, this is, this is my point of view. Uh, and, and I like the fact that it's in the making. It's for us in the travel industry to better define and build what sh experiential travel should be. And I'll tell you more about what we're trying to do with my company. But just to finish on defining experiential travel, you can have, you can experience it on your own. You can also have someone, whether it's a friend or a tour guide. Now, the key difference is, again, this is my point of view, the tour guide or the person, what we call the storyteller, is there not only to um, tell you, share knowledge, tell you about what you're visiting, but the key role of that person leading the way and guiding you into that experience is to facilitate, to moderate. So we're, this is a different skill set in a way or a new skill set. You're moderating, you're facilitating, you're enhancing an experience. You're allowing tourists, visitors, your audience to connect with people, to ask questions, to come up with their own questions. You are creating an environment a safe environment where people feel they can, they want to stay there and they want to, you know, enjoy the lake and they want to be swimming there for a long time and come back with those memories and those conversations. Uh, so that's that would be my my answer. So it's not a it's not a clear clear answer, but it at least it gives everyone I feel enough 
enough tools and enough um, you know words uh, mm -hmm. to connect with what experiential travel is. I think that's a great explanation um, and and love the analogies. <laughs> and so you've told us a bit about what experiential travel is. Do you think this is something that's growing in popularity or continue to grow and why? So um, it is it is growing. There, there's a lot written about how experiential travel is growing. Why, what I wanted to focus on is give you maybe three um, three main points on why I feel it's growing and how it's growing. Uh, you can actually read more about experiential travel and trends. There are many reports that are coming out. There's a lot of interest around experiential travel, but I'll try and bring it down to three points which are, to me, important. The first is technology. Technology is helping us and has been helping us uh, with our smartphones, with all the applications that are being created. As a traveler, you can share, you can rate experiences. You have access to experiences, to, to travel destinations um, that you, you could not before beforehand. Uh, so technology is clearly helping you. Uh, and I'll just highlight Instagram and food, right? I told you we would go back on food. Um, mm -hmm. Instagram and food would be the best, it's the best combination. You know, great photos, inspiring photos. Um, I wanna do that recipe. Uh, I wanna, you know, I wanna buy those ingredients. I want to. I want that food. I want all my senses, the smell, the taste. I want that. Uh, so that's one of the examples. But be, with technology, you have, I mentioned Lonely Planet with, um, you know, augmented reality. There's virtual uh, tourism. Uh, that's how we met Helle through your the report you wrote on virtual tourism. So technology is a big component on why I feel it has been growing and it will continue to grow. The second second point on popularity and growth is the pandemic. What we're going through, and I, I hope you will all relate to what I'm going to share, you Helle and everyone listening to us. But during the pandemic, when we were able to go out for even for a short weekend, and I took a weekend uh, after our lock, our first and second lockdown, uh, or actually just before our second lockdown in France, I took a weekend in, with friends in the south of France. Now those four days were very, very intense. Uh, with my friends took me to all the, their cherished experiences. We went to meet with a winemaker, we went on a boat ride, we, and the intensity was very, very was stronger than any time in my life because of that sort of the fact that we did not have access to that. So I feel moving moving out of the pandemic and shortly everyone globally we're going to be moving out of the pandemic. I think we will be cherishing quality versus quantity. Uh, it's it's a maybe a bold we. Uh, I'm not generalizing here, but I do feel that more and more the purpose, why we travel, will be more important than ever. We might travel less, uh, but we will travel in a more qualitative, and our expectations will, will be higher than before. Um, the last, the last, the third point about why I feel strongly about experiential travel is, and this re relates to my own experience, is, but it's also studies show this, business travel, and leisure travel are going to blend. More and more people that are going for business are going to tag on a weekend or an afternoon and enjoy, even if it's a, a two hour experience doing a recipe, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to want to do that. Uh, I When I traveled, I went to Tokyo and I did something that I'll, I, yeah, I talk about it with emotion um, still today is visiting the fish market and seeing the auctioning of the tunas. So I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to get online. Um, and these are experiences that even the locals, uh, and I'll tell you more about what, what we're doing in Paris, but even the locals in Tokyo maybe do not know about or or um, are, are interested in maybe, but it was just fascinating just to see the auctioning happening and the size of the tunas. And then having at six o'clock in the morning 
a, the fresh sushi at the market. I mean, it was just amazing. The best sushi in my life. It was the best sushi meal, breakfast meal in my entire life. So those are the three, you know, technology, pandemic quality versus quantity, and then business leisure blending. I think those are three trends that are very encouraging for, uh, there, there are many others, I'm sure, but I, I just wanted to highlight those, those three. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you. So, oh, just loading. Um, so you've given us a couple of ex examples there, like uh, going to the fish market. Um, do you have any other interesting or any of your favorite examples of experiential travels, just so that people can really get a feel for what it is and what it looks like? Sure. So I know I know. Um, I told you about how fun the tourism industry and my fun years at Lonely Planet were and are. I had a lot of fun at New York, the New York Times. Don't get me wrong. But and I know it is an important component. And also what, what you do, Haley, about, you know, teaching, it has to be, you know, you're passionate, you're bringing motions, it has to be fun, right? Teaching has to be fun. Mm. I'm gonna play a little game with you, Heli, if you, if you allow me to. I'm gonna give you three, I'm gonna give you three experiences. And one of them I did, two of them are aspirational. And you're gonna have to guess which one I did. Okay? Thank so, you. And so since, since I didn't do two of them, I'll just, I won't say I, I'll just describe the experience. Mm -hmm. Being in Tuscany at a vineyard for a few days, picking up the grapes with your bare feet, stumping the grapes, dining with the winemaker, making the wine, understanding the whole ecosystem of wine in Tuscany, uh, sustainable grapes, uh, and the whole commercial model, exporting wine, and then coming back to France with your own bottles and cherishing those bottles and drinking that wine. So that, that's a first for me experiential travel that is, you know, the, the whole senses and you're staying there, you're meeting, it's a family owned vineyard. Uh, so it's just one a, once in a lifetime experience and you're completely immersed. A second experience, experiential travel, um, participating in building an eco-friendly house from the design to the whole conception and following that project from A to Z and really having a, a say into every single piece and understanding the, the mechanics, uh, the techniques, um, and, and really being co-building co 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 this, this house. And the third one is, um, and this, this touches to a whole new area, which could be a whole new theme for, for and you, you may have covered this, this is volunteerism, volunteering and tourism. Going to Cambodia and teaching English to orphans in an orphan school, orphanage school for a whole month uh, and, and really sharing not only the language, but your culture and, uh, and, and really being completely within the culture, living there for, for a whole month. So those are three experiences, experiential travel, which I feel are very strong. They're not intentionally, they're not connected to my business. I actually wanted to, because I know, you know, you, you might ask me questions about my company and this is not a, a pitch, a sales pitch for what I do, but these are, these are three, again, two are aspiring and one is I actually did it. So which one did I do? Hmm. I think you did the first one in Tuscany with the wine. Okay. So it, that was a, it's, it's part of my aspirational ones. That's what I want to do. Uh, the, the one, um, the one I actually did, and I'm speaking to you from the house I built, I built this eco-friendly house I built because I live oh. in, actually in between Paris and Versailles. It was a whole family project. And, the reason I chose this experience is that experiential travel, that's also a key point I want you and your listeners to, to, to come out with. And we'll, I want to talk to you more about this. Experiential travel is not necessarily traveling. You can do experiential travel where you live. And so that, that was an amazing experience, which involved my family. My family was part of this, this whole, uh, it was a, a few year project. And we've been living in this house for for over two years now. Wow, that must have been a great experience. 
it's, it's a it's a life changing experience. It's called a passive house. If you're if you're interested in, um, in this, these types of eco friendly house, it's called a passive house, and it was developed by a, a German engineer in the early nineties. Oh wow! So you mentioned about um, volunteer tourism. That is something I know a lot about actually, because my PhD research was on. Um, TEFL tourism, teaching English as a foreign language. But because there was very little research that had been done in that area, I used volunteer tourism, which was seen to be the, the sort of closest activity um, that had a lot of research and literature on. So I, I've done a, a lot of reading, a lot of research in yes. that area. And I've done it myself a couple of times as well. So uh, I'm sure you, you will thoroughly enjoy that when you do get the chance to go yeah. out there to Cambodia. It's, it's, um, you know, it's about meaning and purpose. So that's why I put volunteers, volunteerism in the category of experiential tourism. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, to I totally see that it is a form of experiential tourism, absolutely. Um, so if somebody wants to do something like this, like go and be a volunteer tourist or um, go and make wine or build houses, I guess they're very different. But if, if somebody wants to do this kind of thing, how do they find it? How can they book it? So there is um, there's no straight rule or straight answer. You can actually, and, and especially now with technology, you know, you can start off with Airbnb, where they, they, they developed a whole, and you probably, everyone knows mm. these, these experiences, Airbnb yeah. experiences. Um, you can, even on your own with the guidebook, more and more guidebooks uh, print online are, sharing with you exper experiential travel opportunities or or, or uh, leads or contacts where once you're there, you can actually make those connections and make that happen for you and, and build. Um, tour operators more and more are, are, are turning to experiential travel and offering a whole rounded experience that includes meeting with locals, um, living with a family, uh, hotels, I, we, we do a lot of work with concierge and more and more they're pre presenting opportunities in a city to connect with locals or in a way they are, they are the locals. So you're connecting already. If, if it's a concierge in a hotel, he is a local, he is a Parisian. So you are speaking to someone who knows a lot about his city. Uh, and that's the best entry point for, uh, for experiential travel. Um, tourist offices are uh, you know, city in cities, local tourist offices are good sources. I'll tell you a story. Uh, recently, uh, we were we did a, a break, a family break in Brittany. We were in a little city called Dinard, uh, D I N A R D. It's next to Saint Malo. Many people know Saint Malo, but if you just go across the little bay, uh, you have Dinard. And I walked in the local uh, tourism office and I said, you know, I have two sons. And I want them to go on a fishing expedition. I want them to, I want to teach, or I want them to learn how to fish. Sea bass fishing is very big in Brittany. And through the local tourist office, I got the name of a fisherman who is part of a family of fishermen and who takes out families, kids for a fishing, a, a half day fishing expedition. And that oh, was, wow. you know, that is experiential travel at, a, you know, at its best. You're there with someone who is teaching you the art of fishing, tells you about his story, mm -hmm. uh, about the economy, the fishing economy in Brittany, about what's happening also with uh, the world, climate change, and how that has impacted mm -hmm. their industry and his work. So that that was, uh, you know, to your, to your question of how do you find, how do you book, um, Maybe if I want to leave you and your audience with a key point, it is really a question of time. How much time do you have to prepare your next trip? And depending on how much time you have, you can do it all on your own and do the whole experiential travel from A to Z. But more and more, you'll now find if you don't have enough time, or if you feel what is what you're finding is not meeting your expectations, you can then rely on partners, professionals, whether it's a travel advisor, uh, 
um, because I didn't mention travel advisors and we work with many travel advisors. They also present more and more tra experiential travel opportunities and sometimes only that. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, time I think is the main cursor, right? Is how much time do you have to work on your next trip? But then friends, I would say, if you have friends, and I think we all have those experiences. Friends are that live locally are the best door mm -hmm. to experiential travel. Yeah, give you all the insider tips. Yeah, and it's it's also about um, you know we are in this world where uh, more and more you have information at your fingertips, and therefore you you it's important to have people you trust who can validate. Uh, what you you want to do, what you're thinking of doing. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, technology, as I mentioned earlier, it helps you because you can rate and you can share and you can rate. But friends are also the best. You know, if a friend tells you, no, no, don't bother going there. It's a you know, it's a tourist trap. Uh, then you know that's that's a good source. Yeah, I think at the moment as well because people are confined to a particular geographical area most people are um people are traveling deeper a lot of the people sort of travel bloggers and instagrammers i follow so i'm learning a lot of great stuff from them that whereas people might have for example um i've seen some people who live in australia and they've been writing about some great places to go and visit and that those places are not in your usual sort of what to do on the east coast itineraries because mm -hmm. People are just scratching the surface, as you say. It's a big country. People don't spend too long. Whereas now, people are really starting to dig deep because they've been almost forced to, um, or, they, or that's their only option for travel is is within their area. And actually, you find that there's a lot of great stuff to do that people don't always know about, which I think is great. Exactly. Uh, so I took these pictures from your website. I'm sure you've probably noticed by now. Yes. Um, We've got some great images on there. So what are the benefits then of experiential travel? And, and again, I see we're, we're back to cooking with this image. <laughs> um, well, to, to, to connect with what you were saying just, just earlier about you know, going off the beaten track and discovering places that are not necessarily known, uh, I put benefits in, in, from two perspectives. One is for the economy, for the communities, for the locals. Uh, it's what you're, you were just saying. It's opening up new destination destinations, uh, which um, you know you would not know, necessarily know about if someone is not bringing you there, whether it's a friend or a company. And that actually is a very um, it's it's a very nice sort of cycle where it's a virtual cycle because you're helping that economy you, and that local economy. And I'll share with you a story. Uh, last summer we stayed in France, obviously. Uh, and many French people rediscovered France. They rediscovered their beautiful country. And so, you, cause, because you were forced to just stay in France. And we went in the Alps. Um, we experienced mountains during the summer. And in the Alps, we went in the country and a, a, a part of the Alps known for a cheese, food again, uh, a cheese called Reblochon. Even for French people, it's difficult to pronounce. Re mm -hmm. Uh, Reblochon, R-E-B-L-O-C-H-O-N. That's their specialty. And with my family, we, we just walked on our own and we went up in the mountains and we met with this farm, this lady who made her entire life, she's making Reblochon. And she was telling us about how she makes a hundred cheeses, a hundred Reblochon every single day. She even wow. told us that we met her daughter. Uh, her daughter, also makes the, the cheeses with her, the Roblochon. She told us the day I gave birth is the only day in my life where I did not make a hundred cheese. The next day after the birth of my daughter, I was back making a, making my cheese. And so we bought cheese from her. And this is where the economy, it's, it's going to my point. We bought cheese from her at the same price as we would have bought it in a supermarket. That, that was her price. And we, we were Totally fine and, and glad about that. We bought a few, a few cheeses. My point here is we found this on our own. There are many amazing places like that one that I just described around the world where if you can, if you can bring visitors who want that experiential travel, ex 
and 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 meet with people and speak to these 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 artisans, these craftsmen, um, then that could help their economy. That can help them because the margin she makes selling the cheese to us directly versus the supermarket is is higher. Uh, so that's an, an important point. So I think to your question about the benefits, there's one is to the economy mm -hmm. and to the locals, and the other is to the traveler. And I believe that is a strong benefit. If you go deeper, if you you know enjoy and you want to dive into the, the experiential travel world, you in my point of view is that you will get a, a more you know global rounded understanding of the world, uh, about a, a country, about a town, its culture, its history, its food, the political uh, landscape, the society as a whole, even the language. I mean, Haley, did you do you know how uh, how French people say uh, good? Something is good. They say they say they say. Well, they actually say in French that we all we use a lot pas mal. It's not bad. Not bad in French. Pas mal means means often it's good. And if it's really good, you'll say vraiment pas mal. Really not bad. Now, just just learning a language and understanding from a local that nuance of how pe French people say good, then you can you can open up a whole conversation about language and about mm -hmm. culture and understand and better understand a culture and people. Yeah, I, there's definitely benefits and in, in the, the tourists themselves um, mm -hmm. in terms of learning about the culture, in terms of education, and in terms of, um, I think, just having an experience that you feel is like, as you said, a, a sort of deep experience and something that's going to stay with you and 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 that. Um, a bit lost for words now, but yeah, it, definitely there are a lot of experience uh, benefits <laughs> to experiential travel. Um, so moving on then to your company, can you tell us a little bit more about Secret Journeys? Uh, sure. Um, so I mentioned uh, my background in in travel in in storytelling. Uh, coming from media and, the media and publishing wor world. Uh, so after I left the New York Times, uh, I did a, a few years of consulting work. And while I was doing the consulting work, I was maturing this idea of how can I blend storytelling, quality storytelling, um, immersive storytelling, and, and travel. And so obviously experiential travel was an opportunity for me to say, Let's let's think about experiential travel and let's bring experiential travel to the next level. Let's see how far we can go with experiential travel. And again, to the point where I was telling you earlier, you can experience amazing, amazing things in your hometown. Well, I said to myself, Paris is the perfect place to start off with secret journeys and to try and blend storytelling to the world, the world of, of travel. Um, you'll see if you visit um, my website, uh, where you can find those, those beautiful pictures, you'll, you'll see the tagline. Our tagline is exclusive access, expert storytelling, storytellers, and unforgettable experiences. And that's sort of a promise in everything we do, the experiences we create. So what Secret Journeys is, is we create, we produce, we build, we co-create with destinations, amazing, memorable experiences that are very, very experiential. Uh, so that's each time we look at um, the best storyteller, who is going to carry that story, who's going to be that moderator, facilitator, which I alluded to. Mm. How are we going to use the space, right? We view every space, whether it's Montmartre, which is like a stage, uh, whether it's Notre Dame, and I'll tell you more about Notre Dame, any, any destination in our collection that you can see, we look at it as a, as a stage, and there is a choreography, a sonography. How do you best use those amazing places, destinations? And how do you carry that story? And what story do you carry? So we also think really hard about what is the angle, the perspective, what do we want to share and how we want to share it. And we always want to add the emotion. So there's always a layer of, of magic, of poetry, of emotion in everything in everything we do. Uh, so right now we have nearly 20 different destinations. We're adding new destinations. We work in Paris and we go a bit outside, Versailles obviously, and 
um, Volvicomte, which is the castle that inspired Versailles, the Palace of Versailles. I just maybe wanted to follow to to, to highlight maybe a, a couple of experiences that we've created, so you can understand what I mean by taking it to the next level and what we mean about experiential travel. Uh, and I hope we're fine with time. Uh, uh, you, you, you let me know, Haley, if I need to speed up. Uh, yeah. um, I, I'll just interrupt you before we move on because we've got a couple of comments. Um, so Diana says she absolutely agrees with you, interacting and supporting the local communities and discovering your own backyard is really important in this pandemic times. And I think the pandemic has really highlighted that, hasn't it? Um, and then we've got Joseph has said, I really like the economic benefits of experiential tourism to artisans and local communities. The cheese making mm. lady story is truly inspiring. Mm. Um, so uh, that's good feedback. Um, and Deanna's asked if she can have your website. Um, I, if I, I'll get the link and then I can just add it in there. Well, thank um, you for, for these comments, uh, everyone, uh, Deanna and I actually can see these comments, uh, Haley, as well. So thank you for all the comments you're, you're sending, and and please feel free um, to to email me directly uh, and and find me on LinkedIn or, or any other means to, to even to have a to have a chat. Uh, I'm I'm really really happy to to meet you and, and get to know you um, and answer any other questions. Uh, what I wanted to highlight maybe is a couple of examples. Um, we we were we launched Secret Journeys was launched. Uh, in September 2018, we were lucky, but you'll understand how our story is uh, could be a bit tragic. But we were lucky to share to, to start with the Notre Dame, the cathedral. Uh, so I, I actually went to meet with Notre Dame, and I, I said, "This is what we want to do. This is what we are. This is who I am." Mm -hmm. And we were able to create. Every week we had until the fire, the tragic fire of April 15th, 2019. So for almost um, you know, six, seven months. Every week we had for 10 guests, we had a, a three hour immersive experiential travel uh, uh, a moment where the cathedral was closed to the public. So there you have the notion of exclusive access. Mm -hmm. During the rehearsals of the concert, because there was a concert every single Tuesday on every, every single week in the, in the cathedral. So you during the rehearsals, you were alone in the cathedral. Uh, we went to the the, the the organ the big organ balcony which is a place that you never go to we went into the choir we went into the sacristy we had a meeting with the head of the music program they do research they organize the concerts uh and they have a school they run a school a music school so we had a, a moment to share and and a conversation that we moderated with the head of that that organization it's an association and then we had front row seats for our guests for the concert. Mm -hmm. And what was nice about that cooperation beyond the experience is that we gave back. Uh, it's, so you have that notion of giving back to the association. So we actually thanked every particip participant saying, thanks to you, this association can continue their work with the cathedral. And in a way you are participating into the, the restoration and, and the life of, of the cathedral. So it's also about connecting uh, what 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 we do, what I do, is connecting the dots between the past, the present, and then giving you a sense of what's 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 coming, the future, and that's also something that is is key, a key component to to whatever we do. Um, if you're interested to know more about Notre Dame, we've just launched a podcast. So I um, uh, I, I interview partners, friends, storytellers, and the first um, show uh, is called Le Podcast by Secret Journeys Paris. And it's a 25 minute interview of the head of communications of Notre Dame. And you'll, if you're interested in, and you enjoy podcasts, you can find it on any, any platform. You just look for Le Podcast by Secret Journeys. Um, another, another experience, and it's nice that you put the Montmartre, uh, the Montmartre uh, picture there, is we, we have launched an experience with the, the the vineyards of Montmartre. And I don't know how many of you lis listening, and I don't know, Hilly, if you ever visited and, and have seen that there is a small vineyard. It's an urban vineyard on the top of the hill on the north side. And we actually designed an entire experience where you get to meet the winemaker, you get to taste the wine, and, uh, and we carry a story 
And this is interesting because we're the only ones, I believe, and if you, you know others doing this, but we're the only ones carrying the story of a person. His name is Francisco Pulbo. He was an illustrator and he, uh, uh, an affichiste, he made posters too from the, er the early 20th century. And he's the one that kept this parcel of land on Montmartre for the children of Montmartre. So they, have, they can have a playground. And then he converted this parcel of land into a vineyard to actually make money for the charity, a charity that he created called Les Petits Poulbeaux, the Little Poulbeaux, to help the orphans on the Butte Montmartre. And so when we when we carry that story, we we and that experience, we we tell you about this character, Francisco Poulbeau. He's got a statue in the vineyard. And not only that, but you actually meet with the Petit Poulbeau. These are little kids, they're no, no, not necessarily orphans, but they're little kids who are needy and they play the drums. And uh, I'll have to send you a picture, Haley. But uh, they, uh, they lead you into the vineyard playing their drums and they're dressed with amazing outfits. As a matter of fact, if you look, look at, uh, we did in March with uh, a, a, a master storyteller, his name is Oliver G. Uh, we did a live YouTube for one hour where together we, we brought, uh, we followed the Petit Poulbeau into the vineyard. And so you can get a taste. It's a one hour YouTube. You just look for Oliver G, uh, the Airful Tower, and, um, and you'll, you'll get a taste of what, um, what we do uh, with, uh, through, through a video. Um, we're actually also, and maybe this is my little moment of uh, um, you know, advertising, but we're also launching beyond the podcast, we're launching uh, a clubhouse room. So I don't know if many of you are on Clubhouse, but we're experimenting because for us, the best way to share what we do is, you know, you can do a lot of great things on, on a website, but it's also by, by speaking, by inviting our, our experts, our storytellers. So on Club Room every Wednesday, starting next week at 6 p.m. CET, for one hour, we're going to have a theme every hour and uh, every week, sorry. And next week is about the Clos Montmartre, the vineyard. And our storyteller, storyteller Laurence, will be our keynote uh, guest. So if you want to learn more about that specific experience and that story, please please join us. Um, as as say, I'll just put it in the comments. What, uh, what time and day did you say that was? Uh, so it's on Wednesdays, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, CET. And so you have to join um, Clubhouse and more and more people are in Clubhouse, but it's this new medium where we're, we are experimenting. Um, maybe just to finish on you know who we are, what we do, we've been, we work with hotels uh, in Paris. We work with travel designers, travel advisors worldwide. Uh, we also have um, guests, clients who find us directly on our website. You'll see on our website, we have a section called Gazette, and that's to connect with our DNA. We have articles, um, the podcast is there too. And um, so we, 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 re we really wanna keep the storytelling alive on also on our, um, on our website. And then corporate, we do more and more corporate work, and especially with the pandemic, uh, we've been turning to connecting with more French companies. That's why our website is in French. And, um, and also virtual, next week we're doing a virtual uh, tasting storytelling experience where we send champagne, we send caviar to our guests, and then we, we bring them into a whole story around um, um, uh, the Place Vendôme and Millerio, the, the, the oldest jewelry house in the world, which is based in Paris. So you can find all of that on our website. But I mean, the point is really experiential travel, you can also virtual for us meant uh, working with the senses. Uh, and maybe that's maybe something to add to your thought your thought process around experiential travel. It's always about senses. All the senses have to be working. And that creates these, you know, moments that you, uh, and that thought process that you'll, uh, and that intimacy that uh, that you'll bring back. I think um, when, from when I spoke to you last time, that was, that was one of the things that I loved about, um, you know, what, what Secret Journeys is offering is there are so many companies out there that are doing virtual tourism right now, but it seems to be just as a kind of, um, oh, well, we can't physically travel, so we'll do a video instead, and then we'll stop when we can do it again. 
and there hasn't most of the time there hasn't been a, a huge amount of thought it's just kind of a live stream on YouTube or um, Facebook or something like that whereas your experience is the fact that you actually send out things to people so that whilst you're not physically together you are drinking the same champagne and and you're experiencing that side of it as well that brings more than one sense into it like you mentioned about senses I love that because I think that that is really unique and that's something that's quite special um yes and, and it calls upon and it calls upon new skills uh, and I know you want to talk about skills but in 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 the in, in you know related to experiential travel but it calls upon new skills where you know how do you create a moment where it could be even like a ritual like it, like this this moment where people connect Mm -hmm. And it, it is true that having being able to send, you know, a wine, uh, a cheese or something and then being together in that moment and lifting your glass. So this is water right now here, <laughs> but lifting your, gra your glass and toasting together, even if you're far apart, yeah. it helps, helps bring that connection. And it, it is more effort. Uh, it calls upon new skills. But it is, um, I, I believe, the way the way forward. And. You know, hopefully, virtual will remain as a complement uh, to 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 you know to physical experiences. Yeah, I, I think absolutely, absolutely will. So, if there is anybody who wants to get involved in this area, whether they um, are considering a, a job or maybe a career in experiential travel, what advice would you give them? So, um, it's interesting because. I'm going to give you really again. These are all my thoughts, uh, you know, um, that are educated with my experience and what I'm doing today. But I believe this is very bold. What I'm going to say that it's that experiential travel is more than a career path. Uh, experiential travel, for me, to me, is is a mindset. It's a mindset that you can apply to any role, any position across the travel industry, but even, even other industries. And to me, it's sort of this, I, I would define experiential travel as, in a way, it's like a layer, it's a component that you can add, which will enhance the experience that a visitor, a client, a tourist will have. And so it's really making it, what can you add, what value can you add to make it more authentic more inspiring, more fun, more emotional. And so it's 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 really about finding, you know, are you someone who is already sprinkling your life, personal and professional, with experiential travel? You know, are you already into that mindset? And if you're enjoying it, my advice to your question, if you're enjoying that part of you, then bring it more into whatever you're doing um, and, and, and hone that skill, muscle that skill so that it becomes and, and it makes what you're doing very, very unique and exceptional. And uh, I'd like to and I'll ask you a question, Haley, you know, in your because you're 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 in a, a foreign country right now. Mm -hmm. You have children. You know, what are experiences that you're bringing every week back home from a conversation uh, with uh, a local that you're bringing and that, you know, store, with your storytelling skills, you're bringing that into the conversation uh, and you're learning, you're constantly learning. So that's what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make. And I have a, maybe to end on this question, I have a, an example to share with you that's very recent. But what I mean by this layer of experiential travel that, that you can add everywhere, uh, but but yeah, it, it is about bringing that back. I don't know if you're th you're thinking about a uh, uh, well, you're thinking about maybe an example. If you have one, I'll share with you right now the example I want. I thought about was last week. So my wife and I we love to to cook, uh, and uh, I I actually have a sweet tooth, so I love. I love bagels, baguettes, as I told you, but I but I love pastry. My wife follows this this famous French chef. Her name is Hélène Darroze, Helen Darroze, D A R R O Z E, on Instagram. 
So again, to my, my earlier point, and um, she made last week a rhubarb tart. And the rhubarb tart she made had a layer of, um, of almond paste, marzipan, mm -hmm. then the rhubarb, and then the magic layer that Hélène Barros was able to bring to that tart was an apricot marmalade glaze on the rhubarb. And so just that glaze that comes from Hélène Barros, this chef, who has tasted so many combinations in recipes through, through her entire life, that glaze made that rhubarb tart exceptional. And so exceptional that I'm sharing it with you and I'm telling all my friends about this yeah. rhubarb tart. And so, <laughs> so I'll send it to you, Haley. I'll send you the recipe. But so that for me, it's, it's a great metaphor. I told, I told you I love metaphors. What is that apricot marmalade glaze, that experiential travel in a way glaze that you can add to everything you do? So, so the rhubarb tart moves from, you know, a good tart, pas mal, <laughs> mm -hmm. to vraiment pas mal or exceptional. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, that I, I thought about that to better share. Uh, you know your your what 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 advice I can give about uh, connecting with experiential travel in in your worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in in answer to your question, I think living in China generally is a uh, a pretty deep <laughs> cultural um, experience all round, really, um, because the food's different, the language is different, every everything's different, and especially where I live, you you can't really get away from that. So uh, I probably got stories from pretty much every day <laughs> since we've moved here. But I won't go on for too long because YouTube likes to cut me off when we get to an hour. <laughs> We're on 52 minutes now. And um, so I will round it up. Thank you so much for your um, the chat today. I think people found it really interesting. Um, and uh, I'll just acknowledge Prithal, um, who dropped a few comments. He is a um, tour guide in India and he does experiment experimental travel um experiential travel sorry as well so i think he was he was pretty interested so if anyone does have any questions for philippe um do leave them in the comments and he will see them um if not i can pass them on to him and um, do you have any final remarks well final remarks well i would thank every you know everyone for watching uh thank you Haley, again because i think it's 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 interesting this this conversation that we're having made me you know, advance my own thought process around experiential travel. And, and um, you know, my last thoughts is experiential travel is whatever we want to, to, to make uh, and to build. Uh, I, I like the idea of, you know, community, um, but the community of, you know, Prithal doing, you know, your, do, doing your thing where you are around experiential travel. So it's, it's sort of all together to lift that and to give, um, um, perhaps you know a more meaningful and purposeful experience to people who you know who take the time in their lives, they spend money, they invest time and resources to travel. So I think the challenge is how do you make that as as meaningful to them, as worthwhile to them, uh, mm -hmm. as as they they should expect. So it's it's um, I think it's sort of a, a a collective effort. That would be my last uh, last yeah. thought. And um, what you're doing is contributing to that, Haley. So, so thank you for that. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so next week, we will be building on the topic that we touched on today, which was virtual tourism. Um, we've got Bernard Frischer is going to be talking to us. And he is um, the founder of a company called Flyover Zone. Um, and he's going to tell us all about what they do and how they can uh, transport us in time. So it's a very interesting one. That will be on Wednesday next week at 9 a.m. China time and 9 p.m. EST time because he's in America. So for the people in Europe, it's not the ideal time, but you can watch it back. Um, and then if you have enjoyed this, do follow along on social media. There's my links on Facebook. Um, I've recently started a bunch of new educational videos on YouTube. So any new subscribers um, and likes and comments, etc., is much appreciated. So thank you once again, Philippe. And uh, hopefully we can uh, everyone will tune in next week. Thank, thank you, Haley. I, I see that you have. We have one question from Doctor uh, 
Uh, and and please please email me that question, uh, and maybe through Haley you can send me that question. I'll be happy to answer. Sure. Au revoir. À bientôt. Okay. Au revoir.